winter on the high felt. It's cold, it's dry, and it's time for a July story. July? No, I'm telling you the truth. In 1973, when cars like this were brand new, my dad took us on a long distance driving holiday. The speed limit on the highway was 80 kilometers an hour because there was a worldwide energy crisis and the price of fuel was through the roof. And luckily, 50 years later, all of that's behind us. But at that time, it took three days to drive from Cape Town to more or less where I am now, the region of the Michalisburg Mountains. The trip wasn't uncomfortable for us kids because the adults made sure that you were nice and safe on a completely loose bed on the back seat. And we had constant entertainment. There was this weird thing called looking out the window or getting punched by your older brother. Anyway, the trip had to be carefully planned because filling stations closed at 6 p.m. and on weekends. So even stopping for fuel was a huge treat because every time Dad filled up at a Celtics petrol station, we got one of these. A free sticker of an Apollo mission badge. This was the time when the public was crazy about humans going to the moon. And we stuck them in a special album that you got as a supplement in the Sunday Times newspaper. This booklet was full of pictures of rockets and moon photographs and it told the stories of the astronauts and weird and wonderful things that I could literally only dream of. I mean, this one is an original album that I found on an auction site and I just had to grab it. Filling it with stickers was, was one of the greatest parts of the trip at the time. You see, South Africa didn't even have television in those days. The old government regarded it as the devil's goggle box. And so we may get to see the occasional newsreel at the drive-in, but for us, the moon landings were something that we listened to on Springbok Radio. Maybe that's why, for such a long time, I've always maintained that the first people in space were actually Afrikaans-speaking. I mean, imagine if you were a South African kid and you heard something called Star Trek. <laughs> what would you assume? The proof was right there in the opening lines. These are the missions of the starship Fenterprise. That's a Fenter trailer with a Hilux engine. It'll go anywhere in the universe. I mean, look here. Pictures of moon rocks. South Africans understand. Sometimes you have to travel far for a clippies. <laughs> Beautiful view, magnificent desolation. I'm quoting, those were the words of Buzz Aldrin, the lunar module pilot of Apollo 11, when he stepped out onto the surface of the moon. Now, we remember the other famous words spoken that day when Neil Armstrong said, that's one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. But Aldrin, who climbed out shortly after the commander, who uh, was every bit as much of a pioneer as Armstrong, never got quite the recognition. I guess we like simple stories, one hero at a time. And we neglect the other important people just behind them who made it all possible. That's what I realized when I turned to the last page of this booklet just the other day. And there's a little paragraph right at the back entitled South Africa's contribution. And that paragraph brought me here to a place that was known as Deep Space Station 51, less than an hour's drive outside Johannesburg. Folks, if you are as surprised by this place as I was, then please like this video, share it, and most importantly, subscribe because that will genuinely help just off the highway to stay on the road. Late in the night, on the 21st of July, 1969, the adults woke me up, got me out of bed, and plonked me in the lounge in front of this huge old radiogram 
listening to scratchy voices saying things I didn't understand. And it was the Apollo 11 moon landing happening live. Oh, I was clueless, but I could tell that it was something important by the way they shushed me into silence. So I just listened and stared at that old Blaupunkt radio. It had a badge, a blue dot, the Blaupunkt logo. And now as an adult, I imagine the astronauts had a similar view of Earth, their little blue home so very far away. One of humanity's greatest moments was unfolding and this place helped make it happen. We're being hosted here today by Marion West and I'm afraid just her title defeats me. So Marion, please tell us what is it that you actually do? I, my title, as I quite agree with you, it's quite a long one, but um, it's coordinator. Hard to be is took science engagement and research. So science engagement is doing things like hosting people like you, hosting public tours, hosting school groups, these kind of things we've done a lot over the years. And then on the research side, I actually do research into radio astronomy. Now this place is not still called Deep Space Station 51, is it? I mean, <laughs> that's just too sci-fi to be imaginable. No, it's basic. It was called that in the 1960s up to 1974 when it was busy tracking things like the, the probes that went to Mars and Venus and the early probes that went and took photos of the moon. And so currently, up until a few years ago, we were the Harderbeers took Radio Astronomy Observatory under NRF, but now we have joined with the SKA project to form the South African Radio Astronomy Observatory and the SKA project is a square kilometre array which will be the biggest radio telescope in the whole world once it's finally built. Now what was the role of this facility in the early history of space exploration? Basically this place was used, it was built by the Americans they were in such a rush, because they were in competition with the Russians in terms of space exploration, they were in such a rush to get this telescope up and running that they poured the concrete for the foundation on Christmas Day 1960 and the whole place was up and running by July 1961. Then it was used for tracking the early spacecraft that went to Mars and Venus and for the spacecraft that took photographs of the Moon and actually some of them that crash landed onto the Moon um, in order to prepare for the Apollo missions. They wanted a telescope in Africa because if you think of a spacecraft taking off from Cape Canaveral and flying around then eventually the earth turns and you can't send a signal to it anymore. So they actually brought this telescope out almost like a Meccano set. They flew it out and it was built basically you know put together and that's also part of the reason why it could be up and running by 1961 July. Okay Given that I only have a BA and most of this science stuff just goes over my head like a frisbee over a lazy Labrador, how does this facility now fit into South Africa's current contribution to science and, and research? So the transmitters were taken off and it simply receives radio waves coming from space. Then I came along and I was looking at stars that will be where the sun will be in another 5,000 million years time. And that is where we team up with telescopes on other continents and we look at the same object at the same time and because of the distances between the telescopes and because radio waves are so long compared to light we can actually combine the observations so that we can synthesize a telescope that is as big as the distances between the individual units. Another science that came out of that is what's called geodesy and that is where we use the very, very far away galaxies, the quasars that have been emitting light since almost the beginning of the universe. We can actually get the distances between the telescopes to better than centimeters per year. And so we know the Hotterbeestuk telescope is moving towards India at about two and a half centimeters a year. You realize there is an awful lot of social distancing between us and out there. So can you tell us something that would really wow a young person, get them to lift their head up from their phone and just study astronomy? Well, some of the exciting things that we have discovered is these burnt out remains of tremendously big stars. They actually have star quakes occasionally and we call that a glitch. We needed to measure what the behavior of these stars were 
when they had one of these star quakes. So we have got some of the best data in terms of the star quakes um, in the world. The moon's up. It's getting colder than a frog's fingerprints. And thanks to Marion West and the South African Radio Astronomy Observatory at Hartebeeshoek for making a little boy's dream come true. Years ago, on that family road trip, I wanted to become an astronaut. It never for a moment crossed my mind that I couldn't. But I was stopped by a very harsh, unforgiving system called mathematics. And being South African didn't help either. Our unjust political system ensured that far too many people were excluded from their dreams too. So it pays to realize that unless we help others achieve their rightful place on Earth, we lose our best shot at our dreams as well. They say when you look out into space, you look into the past. So tonight, I'm out here 52 years, almost to the day after Apollo 11. I'm thinking about Neil and Buzz and Michael Collins and everyone involved in that great adventure of space. And looking into the future, we should never stop telling our kids that they can one day walk on another world. Especially if they do the maths so well. And we should dare to dream. I still want to go into space. And if Elon Musk, another South African, hurries up, who knows? So here's a cup of coffee. Not just to the astronauts, but the teachers, and certainly particular school friends who helped me do science experiments like daring me to jump off the garage roof using a shopping bag as a parachute. Thanks guys. That one still hurts. It's a cold night, hot coffee, warm memories and beautiful moon. <laughs>